Hey, what's going on, guys? We just had Super Tuesday, but we are talking about Super Wednesday. Three up, three down starts right now. What's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics, and this is Three Up, Three Down, where we're covering those hot and cold comic book market trends for this week. But real quick, before we get into the list, we still have pre-orders open right now for those t-shirts, those fantastic t-shirts, don't we, Jack? That's right. There's only about three weeks left to get your pre-orders in for these brand new limited edition Simpleman's Comics t-shirts. We've got the Bolo Club, Bullet Club, G.I. Joe parody t-shirt, an amazing homage. Um, we've also got that excellent mashup with that Chamber of Chills, He-Man Masters of the Universe um, with that awesome Skeletor uh, Simpleman's Comics t-shirt. Be sure to check those out at simplemanscomics.com forward slash swag. Uh, now is the time to grab those t-shirts, get those pre-orders in because they start shipping in April. Yes, and we want to say thank you to everyone that's pre-ordered those shirts so far. If you want to get those, they're on the site right now at simplemanscomics.com. But let's get into that list, starting with the three up portion. And first up this week, we have James Tenian's Batman run, starting with what? Issue number 86. This run's been fantastic so far, hasn't it? That's right. I don't think we can go a week on the channel or on any channel. Um, there can't be a hot list. Um, there can't be a list of books rising up. If we are not talking about punchline, there's no way to avoid it. Um, but this kind of extends beyond that because today is new comic book day. And obviously one of the best books today is Batman number 90 with the first full, you know, I hate that, but first full appearance of the designer. It seems like the fervor for these Batman characters, it, it, people couldn't get enough, right? There was no heat on the designer three weeks ago. We talked about it on the channel. This is a cool looking character, cool character design, a lot of potential here. Um, also and, talked that it could be another bloom. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it was, it was worth a shot. Um, but the problem is it occurring in the same issues where we see punchline makes that no longer a cheap uh, speculation play. And I thought maybe issue number 90 uh, would be kind of an undercover buy, but no, not undercover at all. This book is trading for over $20, cover A, $20, cover B. We're selling sets of the two, selling for as high as 50. And that is on the eve of new comic book day when we record this video. Um, and what this is also doing is drying up those early issues. You mentioned 86, 87, and 88. People are starting to go grab those that are still remaining on store shelves, I think they're building this run. They're looking at this as could Tinian be building something epic? I honestly, not to downplay, I love James Tinian, not to downplay anything with these characters, but I think people are just so excited to be moving on from the Tom King run that they're jumping full force into this Tinian run, and I hope it delivers. Yeah, I enjoyed Tom King's run. We've said it on here on the channel. It's been ups and downs, but I also think the different writing styles are showing. Tom King to me is more of that cerebral, that slow burn style. And James Tinian, he's shot out of a cannon. And I'm loving Tinian's run. It kind of reminds me of that whole Scott Snyder when that whole Night of Owls, Court of Owls. That's where we're at in James Tinian's run with his story right now. But either way, it's definitely hot. And if you haven't done so already, I'd recommend putting it on your pull list. But with that being said, the next one we're talking about for three up this week is Omega Red. We're talking about Omega-3 fatty acids and red quill? No, can't be that, right? No, we are talking about, of course, the X-Men villain Omega Red, uh, who debuted during the Jim Lee X-Men run issue number four, and of course, with that issue number five. Um, this has been a popular cult character for some time, right? This has been the 90s kids' um, kind of favorite villain. He was set to appear in some X-Men movies, never happened. There was a Omega Red in a Deadpool in the background scene of a Deadpool movie um, that kind of went unnoticed and untalked about. I think got even cut out of some of the final cut. Um, and now we have reports that Omega Red is going to be front and center on the Disney Plus network as a main villain um, in upcoming, I believe, Winter Soldier and Falcon. Um, and that's where we're going to kind of get the debut. And it's interesting that we're seeing these mutants debut there's talk about rogue and captain marvel there's talk about omega red here it seems like they're gonna pepper these mutants in throughout the mcu kind of slowly but surely i actually like that approach now omega red was selling for maybe a little hotter last week than this week um but 
what I like is the consistency. There is a number of copies. Yes, this is a highly printed book. There is a plethora of copies on the market. But this book is selling at an incredible clip. There is a serious demand for this book. This is a book that's going to continue to trend upward. I would be on the lookout for it. And still, don't give up on those dollar bits because it's still a book that I find there occasionally from time to time. Yeah, I agree. I think introducing them, especially in those Disney Plus shows, is a great way to introduce them into the MCU. Kevin Feige already said that those Disney Plus shows are part of the MCU continuation to make sure you pay attention to those. A lot of people have been dropping those Disney Plus subscriptions because Mandalorian's on a break. There's no been no original programming that's going to tie into that. It's all the family, the back order catalog of Disney. But those MCU shows are on the way, and I can't wait. Me, Mega Red doesn't really move the needle for me. I remember a lot of hype when they're talking about Bishop showing up in the X Men movie. Not a villain, but either way, there was hype there. Fool me once, I'm sitting this one out. We got to move you past that Fox logic, brother. <laughs> In Feige, we trust. Then the last one we're talking about, the three I'm pushing this week, is Gwenum. This is a bit of an undercover stealth pick, Brian. This is one somebody could argue with me about, but this is one where you have to look beyond comics. You have to look at the total marketplace. First off, from a reader buzz perspective, Gwenum is back with, uh, with the brand new Ghost Fighter 8 and 9. Um, we are reintroducing Gwenum into the storyline. Um, Gwenum is obviously the same. We're talking the same relationship with Gwen and Gwenum that we're, we're kind of seeing with Spider-Man and Venom there. It's a natural enemy, a natural, um, antagonist to be able to bring into the series and is going to get attention and everything symbiote, you know, what happens. So as soon as that happens, there's attention. Um, Gwenum was created by the original creators of Spider-Gwen, Jason Latour, Rai Rodriguez, and Rico Renzi. And when they first began their arc, and I'm talking about the early days, the very first uh, series of Spider-Gwen, when I would interview them, they would constantly tell me, like, in a joking manner, like, oh, man, if we ever get to, like, really do this for a long time, we're going to do Gwen. And it was like this big joke. That was like their jumping the shark moment. Um, but this character didn't go away. The, the community demanded it. And lo and behold, at the end of their run, they got to do uh, Gwenum. And I think that, that that was kind of like their big send-off moment. Was, you know, once they did that story arc, they felt like they were good. So the, I would be on the lookout, obviously, for issue 24, which kind of is that first appearance. Got a great black cover, tough in a 9-8. Um, still affordable in a 9-8. Going for about $20 raw. There's a very hard-to-find second print. It was back in the days when Marvel was punting those largely um so you just get the blue lettering issue 25 there is a second print that has when i'm on the cover also in demand goes for about 10 to 15 we're seeing these copies sell within the last week um there only a few you've probably seen four or five copies of each Gwenum book but you're also seeing a lot of funko pops um you're seeing the ghost spider number eight uh wasn't there a guardians of the galaxy variant guardians had yeah, the, uh, the Guardians of Nowhere. Number Guardians one. of Nowhere. That is similar to the other. It's the other Venomized covers. It's the first time you ever see Gwen Venomized because that cover actually comes out before that character was really created. And the character looks a lot different when they was finally created. Not a, but it looks different. Um, but yes, yeah, so that has kind of like that pre-first appearance buzz. That's still a $15 book, but at one point was a, a major major yeah. variant to chase so it has a lot of potential so there's a three up portion this week and we're gonna go right now into that three down starting with atlas comics and i wasn't too long ago everyone was talking about atlas comics and how they're going to create their own movie universe where's atlas comics now it's still in development but th this is what you and i you guys can go check the tape when atlas comics got sold to universal brian and i sometimes get we get some shit from you guys for being almost pessimistic about certain things on the secondary market, but we're trying to give you an experienced view. So we weren't anti Atlas comics. We just kind of felt like the way that prices spiked immediately on these books, the way everyone was grabbing these up, like this was going to be a quick thing. Brian, you and I knew, we know the spec cycle. We know the way these things work. We know how long movies take to develop. I can't even imagine how long it takes to develop a universe. We don't even know if we'll ever see an Atlas comics movie. But if we do, it's going to be years and years down the pipe. They've got to create an entire 
universe, you've got to bring in a, a, somebody to show run that whole process. Then you've got to bring in writers, directors, um, before you even start figuring anything out. There, there's a multitude of characters. Everyone was guessing which ones they were trying to use whatever logic they could find to pick. We were seeing these books show up on those hot and top lists. We were seeing your favorite YouTubers and your favorite websites championing these books while Brian and I stood back and said, you know, I don't know. This, this seems like everybody's rushing too fast. If you still believe in Atlas Comics, it's actually a great buying opportunity because these books now are dirt cheap. And now is when I would buy them because I do think that it is a good penny play, so much like a penny stock. Like I'll buy these things you know, we're talking about, you know, silver age and books, you know, you know, I'll on bronze age books, I'll buy these, these books for a few dollars, but I'm not going to spend the type of money that they were going when they were on the upswing. So if you were thinking Atlas, and now you've faded back now, maybe the time, but still be cautioned, we may never see something from Universal from Atlas Comics. Yeah, I remember when not Atlas, but when they first announced they're making a mask and this big combined universe with that, I got all excited back then. I got caught up in the hype and was buying a mask at an elevated price. I saw that with Atlas and I sat it out. But either way, you present a good opportunity. If you're a fan of Atlas and you're championing that, definitely now is a good buying opportunity. And of course, because you brought it up and you know I love mask, mask has a director now. So be on the lookout for those mask books heating up sometime soon. Yeah, wasn't it the guy from like Bad Bad Boys Two? From yeah, Bad Boys for Life. The current Bad Boys, Bad Boys for Life. Yeah, the current director of the Bad Boys movie is now on on board. So you've got to imagine big action. I think it's gonna be fun. Then the next one we're talking about for the down portion, we are talking about that Netflix series October Faction. Those books took off when they announced that this was gonna be a Netflix series, didn't they, Jack? Yeah, but this is an example of, of taking off from a speculation perspective. This was a kind of a key collector alert type spike. Again, not to put it on that app per se, but just saying when this thing got optioned and that news spread, we saw those books spike. Um, I don't know if people were October faction readers. I don't know if they, 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 it was that diehard fan base who were the ones who were driving these prices up because it doesn't seem like the audience for the Netflix show has really matched what we saw in the comic market as far as the initial interest in the comic, which drove those prices up. Now the book's still selling for like $25, the first print, but it's the problem is we haven't seen a sale in a week, Brian. We talk about this. A lot of times the various hot, not hot type shows, hot top shows, they focus too much on top line sales. They'll quote a price for a sale, but we're talking about one auction. What they're not doing is looking at how many copies are selling and what that top line price is. Um, you don't see that enough in the market. And that is kind of like that supply and demand kind of, uh, kind of curve. And you're trying to find that sweet spot. And with this one, the prices may still be right, but you, you know, you're just not moving them. And I think you're not moving them because the interest isn't there. Um, Netflix released a lot of comic book properties in a very small period of time. I was, that's what I was going to ask next. Do you think Lock and Key kind of took some of that attention? Because you're not hearing anyone talk about October Faction. I will take it uh, really a step further. I wonder what, I don't know what control IDW had with this, but all three of the comic properties that got released in a very short period of time are all IDW properties with um, V Wars, Lock and Key, and October Faction. And I definitely think they cannibalized each other. I think maybe they thought they would build off of each other, but I don't know that that necessarily happened. V Wars was popular, but for a very short period of time, and then it moved on. Lock and Key seems to have hit with that fan base that we talk about that you need to hit on Netflix for these books to become next level popular, the one that we saw Umbrella Academy hit, the one that we saw, say, with Amazon and the boys, where it goes beyond the typical comic media viewer and it starts getting your wife's and your girlfriends and your your buddy who talks crap about comics on a regular basis when they're watching it that's when you kind of see that crossover success we see that with lock and key um i think that's the clear winner between those three so yeah i do think it had an effect on it um but the great thing about netflix is it's going to stay there essentially in perpetuity uh once they've kind of purchased it, it's their ip uh shows on netflix i will caution people can get popular well after they're released. We've seen that happen um, with various different shows where a show gets popular, people start talking about it on social media, 
the right person starts saying, hey, check this show out. And the next thing you know, you're getting kind of a second wind. So that's always something to keep an eye out for. But I wouldn't buy October Faction unless I saw it cheap. Yeah, speaking of which, I just watched the 1981 Sylvester Stallone movie, Nighthawks. Then the last one we're going to talk about on that three down portion is Francesco Mattina. We, this could be debatable because I do think the covers are gorgeous, but you're still seeing that downward trend. And we've seen him back in the press again with Alex Garner saying that he's stealing his art, right? Right. And we're going to talk about that on this channel in some detail. Um, the, the whole discussion with Alex Garner. And honestly, it's not as cut and dry as some of his other stuff. But the reality is Matina is down because he never regained the initial hype from when the original scandal came out. It's funny how quickly, and you know, I say it's funny as if it's shocking, but it, it is really the way of the world in 2020. But yeah, it was that originally what that fan expo venom variant. Yeah, people can turn their back on you and, and it's so fast. It's funny because you have certain guys like um Arthur Pseudonym, who literally I probably pronounced that wrong, I apologize, but uh who literally every has been caught all throughout his career, but doesn't seem to like get blacklisted. You know, he's able to still kind of put out covers that if they connect with an audience work, but Tina puts out consistently amazing work and just kind of can't shake that negative kind of vibe. Um, that, that, so I think that that's part of it. Um, overexposure is also an issue by doing those DC cover bees while it was a kind of, welcomed change initially because and had, spawn right we had only seen we had only seen matina through store exclusives and marvel incentive variants so his books were hot they were expensive similar to what we're seeing with like peach momoko or shannon mayer is a, is a good example um as soon as his books became accessible and it became easy to get a matina variant that was dope for three dollars kind of the whole luster rubbed off of everything. So I think it's a combination of that that um, kind of art germ fatigue that we talk about mixed with a little bit of just, you know, that cheating scandal stuff. He, he's got a little bit of that 2017 Astros kind of feel to him where there's certain people that just look at him like, man, you know, you, you, were, you, you were doping. Yeah, there's no really, I, you, the comics version of doping, I can't, I can't get down with it. And they're just not gonna respect his art style going forward um but you know it's interesting i think things can change i think but i think art tastes also change um the difficulty with him was his uber realistic style which i think was very unique when it came out has now been duplicated by a number of artists and that's kind of become the style of the next crop of cover artists and i think that you know what matina did that was incredibly unique isn't necessarily incredibly unique anymore and uh you know Hit finding his niche again in the market may be tough. Yeah, but I still love his covers and I still buy them and I like getting them at $3. So thanks. I'm glad it's cold. It's a great buying opportunity for me because I pick them up just to collect for my personal collection. And but, Alex, Alex Garner controversy or not, his Flash 750 is my favorite of the Flash 750 variants with the exception, of course, of that blank red variant, which I think right. is cool. So we talked about it here, but we're going to talk about this topic more so on our next episode of Simple Men's Comics and Friends, right, Jack? Yeah, we're really excited about Simple Men's Comics and Friends, our brand new podcast right here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel, but it's more than that. It's really all about that audio. We are everywhere where you guys get your audio podcasts. We listen to you guys. We tell you guys that on a constant basis. We're paying attention to what you're looking for. And we found out that a lot of our most loyal and hardcore listeners they're, they're on that audio format and they're making those long commutes. And also we like to pride ourselves. We, we like to say we're the, we're the sports talk radio of comics. We want to ha have this to be the home of lively debate. We want this to be the, uh, the home of what is popping currently today in the comics and pop culture market. And to do that, we wanted to have a, a kind of unique podcast where we are discussing the topics of the week. Now we're going to do this on a bi-weekly basis every other week. But what we're going to do to kind of bring a unique and fresh take on it is it's not just going to be Brian and I debating every week. We're going to bring on two guests and we're going to bring them from the comic community. We want to bring on a group, diverse group of guests that will have a diverse set of uh, opinions on topics. And we want this to be an exciting and lively show. And we're excited for our next episode hitting next week.
And with that being said, that's our three up, three down this week. Again, as always, let us know in the comments, what'd you think of the up? What'd you think of the down? What are your hot and cold picks? Comment down below. They may get featured in the next video. Thank you.